This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 183 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. The Adventures of Twinny and Hart. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Question Collections offers a whole universe of equestrian shopping at your fingertips at a price you can afford. Shop online at equestriancollections.com. Plus, Kentucky Performance Products. Visit them at kppusa.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop. With weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. We bring you the news through hail or high water while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop, cause it's time again for Stable School. Stable scoop. Stable scoop. Stable scoop. I am Glenda Geek. And this is Helena B. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, howdy, Helena. Howdy, Glenn. How you doing? All right. We had a wonderful little uh, quick getaway to down there to Ocala, Florida, other horse capital of the world. It was fun over the weekend. Now, is it Ocala or Ocala? Ocala, they say. They say Ocala. Yeah. I like that. That's okay. the New York way. We say it that way, too. <laughs> Ocala. And so how is Ocala? Uh, is Ocala it- is beautiful. It's, uh, you know, this time of year. And I was chilly the couple nights we were there. It got down in the 20s. Wow. But during the day, it gets up to 60, so it's not so hard to take 20. You know, where you live, it's down in the 20s, and the high is 25. Right. You know, right. it goes up 3 degrees. But there, yeah. you know, it goes up 40 degrees. So there's those huge swings in temperature. But it was beautiful. Um, we got a grand tour. My brother took us all around Ocala, all sides. We got to see the forest. Ocala uh, forest is huge there. Mm. And um, are there any? Are there like bears and cougars in the forest? Yes, uh, we were we uh, we were in the forest, and and they tell you that there are bears. The thing that the there are people who live in the forest, unlike other states where they don't allow people to live in the forest, the, the state forest. Yeah, yeah. There are actually communities in this forest, and the people that live in there that have horses have to be aware because there are bears, and the things that actually they have the most trouble with are wild boars. Um, you know, like wild, as in like in wild pigs. That's right. They have the most trouble with those because they're nasty and they they have no boundaries. You know, they're they're not going to run away. They're going to get into trouble all the time. But they also have alligators and all the things, other things you have, big snakes and things like that you have in Florida. Um, did not make me want to go live in the Ocala National Forest. That's for sure with my horses. Just to... <laughs> Didn't make me want to do that, but. We uh, we got to see some beautiful. There, of course, we went up to where Hits is, which is the uh, hunter jumper place in the in the winter time, and uh, that's unbelievable. Like twenty rings with shows going on every day, and every ring being used for classes. It's like a circus. And then we went down to the Florida Horse Park, which is in Southern Ocala, where they had an event, a three day event going on, and we got to watch a little bit of that. That was fun. So, so we we got around and we got to we got to see the sights of Ocala this time. We've been down to my brother's before, but we never really we we're always too busy. We never got out to to check out the area. Right, a lot of horses in Ocala, a lot of farms. Well, I, I thought I read someplace that o- Ocala is actually considered the horse capital. Well, of- they claim they are, and there's been a constant battle between Lexington and Ocala. There's okay. been this war that's been going on between. You know what we should do? We should get a representative each on the show and have a showdown. Oh, I like that. What do you think? I like – now that's the kind of controversy I can deal with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that, I think that will be friendlier than uh, carriages in the city. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, like I do – I idea. I do, you know, I – okay. We'll, well get I the have... head of the Chamber of Commerce here. Okay. And we'll get the head of the Chamber of Commerce there and we'll just let them go at it. All right. I mean, I would definitely agree that Kentucky is the thoroughbred capital. Yes. uh, You know, or the racing capital. That's what the difference is. Around Kentucky, you have huge 1,000, 2,000 acre farms that are all breeding farms for the thoroughbred industry. Right. Down there, you have mom and pops with uh, five acres, 10 acres, and just millions of them, you know? We said it was a cross between Norco, where everybody has 
one acre and 12 horses and <laughs> Lexington. It's sort of like halfway in between the two. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Which so, sounds like a nice little moderate, you know, you right know in the, the middle. The big difference is around here, there's no place to ride because it's all big thoroughbred farms. You're not allowed to ride on them. Down there, they have hundreds of miles of trails. And we actually went to the one trailhead, which is the Florida Greenway. That's the path that goes from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean. It's a, it's a park, a linear park, that goes the entire length of the state. Get out of here. You could ride from one Oh, yes, and there are many people that do, other? apparently. It <gasps> takes about a week to ride it. But a week it, to ride it? Yep. Oh, please. Oh, I want to do that. Do you think Jen would do that with me? Yeah, yep. Bring your bear spray because you do go through the heart of bear and alligator country. So. Oh, oh, alligators too? Yeah, well, it's Florida. <laughs> oh... <laughs> Now, they don't usually bother you if you're on your horse, you know, but, uh, and the bears usually don't bother you too much either. Uh, Can you uh, bring like anti alligator spray with you or something? <laughs> a flare gun? Apparently, like, the bear spray works pretty well on other critters too. Because it's pretty. So, dangerous. there really is something called bear spray? Oh, yeah. You attach it to your saddle. It's a little canister like you would have uh, pepper spray. Yeah. Only it squirts about 20 feet. Oh, man. Honestly, the fact that they actually make bear spray, like, the, because it means you have to use it. Yeah, the other reason that they, they, the other thing they do to keep the bears away is, and they're little black bears down there. The other huh. reason they keep the bears away is that you put a bell on your saddle. Uh, so you're, you're, you have a little bells ringing the whole time you're riding because that, okay. that, that sound just keeps them off. So then what really is the problem with bears? I mean, if they're just kind of camping at night thing. Yeah, but you're, oh, oh, <laughs> right. Well, if it does, if it takes you a week to get through. Yeah, you're camping at night. Right. Yep. You got five nights of camping in the woods. I'm uh, going to have to look that up, the bear thing. Not that I'm, I don't mind bears, but I keep thinking about that woman who rescued the little boy. <laughs> I mean, that's different. That's a grizzly bear in Wyoming. Yes, exactly. I'm going to guess that this, this Probably particular kind of bear, a little black bear isn't going to be as intimidating. But you know what? A bear's a bear <laughs> when you're alone in the woods and you see a bear. No, it's a, we took a walk on, we actually walked the bike trail and part of the horse trail portion. They actually have bike trails and hiking trails. There's three sets of trails throughout this linear park. And, and at every 20, 30 miles, they have a trailhead where you can, it's beautiful. We, they have bathrooms and you, you drive in with your horse trailer. They have little corrals for your horses. You can camp overnight there with your horses and go out for day trips. It's wow. Just, it's just beautiful. And we took a hike into the woods. Now, got to keep in mind, it's not bug season. It's not hot. And it was absolutely beautiful because it's all pine forests and, and it's sand. You know, the footing's great because it's sand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was neat. It was neat. We had a good time. It was fun. And uh, I can't wait to go back again and bring my bike because uh, uh, we said, well, Jennifer's going to have to find a horse and, and her and my sister-in-law, Pam, has a horse. They're going to have to go out, tra- you know, on t- riding on the trails and we'll bring our bikes along and we'll go out biking and we'll meet back and have a barbecue. Mm. Sounds like a perfect day for a horse person and their horse husbands. Yes, barbecue. <laughs> let us go on our bikes. Thank barbecue. you very much. <laughs> Although you'll have to, yeah, let us go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, I thought you were, all right, that's a whole other show. We're going to yes. have to dive into the whole horse husband <laughs> driving thing. Yes, well, that's another And one. Wendy's down there too, So, and all your friends are down there, so you'll have a good time. Yeah, it, was, it was fun to uh, visit down there. It was a fun visit. I have exciting news for you that uh, Jamie wouldn't let me talk about on the morning show because she's yeah. stuck up. Um, Do you ever hear the name Kate Upton? Kate Upton. I have, but from where? Kate Upton is now the cover girl on this year's Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition that just uh, went on sale. Now, Yeah. Does well, she own a horse? She's a horse girl. Okay, that's fine. Okay. See, she's an equestrian, and actually quite an equestrian. She showed for the American Paint Horse Association and competed on a national level with her horse, Rony Pony. Oh, she won good. three APHA Reserve World Championships at the age of 13. Um, and then she went on, and she's been showing ever since. Since She's had a total of five championships, and uh, she came in second in the world uh, in Western Pleasure for Appalo- or for paint horses. Okay. So she's quite a horse girl. And let me tell you, she's in shape from riding horses because I'm looking at the cover of the magazine. Get right over here. yourself. Oh, <laughs> Jamie, you were right. I, and here I was trying to be open-minded and, you know. Just She's a not be so <laughs> That's fine. You know what? Yes. And let me yeah. tell you something else. They ain't yeah. making bathing suits with much material anymore. 
All right. For those of you, okay, I now I'm going to I'm going to add a little yang to this to to Glenn's <laughs> yang. If any of you women listening today watched the Super Bowl and happened to miss the H&M commercial, H&M. go on to YouTube. Which one was that? Yeah. That was the one starring David Beckham. Oh, okay. Okay. That will put Miss Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover like in the fire bucket. <laughs> I don't know. I bet, yeah. you, I bet you my Use girl that... has bigger assets. No, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just go YouTube the David Beckham ad for H&M. Kate Upton for the win. David Beckham. <laughs> I'll give him a horse. To make it relevant, I will give the man a horse. And there's another show, too, we got to talk about, and that's The Bachelor. Uh, you know, there's a horse girl on The Bachelor now that's made it to the Final Four, and, and she comes from a driving family. Do you watch this show? You really no, watch I that don't. show? No, I don't. I read it. Or actually, Wendy told me about it. Okay. So she comes from a driving family, and uh, from the rumor I hear uh, that there's going to be an, the, uh, one of the upcoming episodes is going to have a lot of horses in it. Oh, so I, I can't stand it. I think they're all fake. But uh, but yeah, so this girl is came from a drive uh, a horse family and is a, a rider. And uh, I think her parents were the drivers They're 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 from Ocala, actually. Uh, so so there, okay. there you go. So if you're interested in that, you're going to see some horses on that upcoming episode, too. At this point, anything that lets horses go mainstream, I'm, I'm all for it. Yes. You yes. know. Well, you know, I'm sure all of those women, after they watch The Bachelor, will be running out to get a horse so they can catch a man. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can uh, let that one go. Just... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm choking on my response here. <laughs> just let it go, Helena. Just, we'll just go on with the show. We have a couple of great guests lined up for today. We have a good friend of the Horse Radio Network has been on shows a number of times, especially the 2010 radio show, because she was in the World Equestrian Games. Her name is Rebecca Hart. She is a Paralympian, and we're going to tell you more about her in a minute because she had something absolutely fascinating happen to her that you don't expect and she didn't see coming. So we're going to get her on. She's delightful. And then we have one of our favorite guests here, don't we? Anna Twinney, whose name you always get wrong, but I got right. Thank you very much. I love Anna. She has – Anna is the the brains behind Reach Out to Horses, and she just – there's, there's, there are very few people in the world who know as much about horses as your wife. <laughs> Anna is one of them. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about uh, – she's got a release of a new DVD. It's Reiki for Horses. That's one of her specialties. Um, she also does a lot of foal gentling. She offers classes and clinics. And she also has a very special gift for communicating with horses, uh, something that uh, – communicating on a different level. Yeah, we did a whole show about that with her. I did one of my one-on-ones with Anna Twinney. If you didn't hear that, just go to our website and search for her. I did a whole one-on-one on animal communication, and, and I came from the side where I don't really believe it, and she 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 almost had me won over there by the end. She of the almost had me, yeah. Well, I'm a believer, and... Um... And I just, you know, I follow her on Facebook, and I really like her philosophy. She's just very level-headed. She's a heck of a trainer. She is. That's it. She combines the practical with the divine, sort of, or the 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 practical with the possible. You know, so many of the quote unquote animal communicators, uh, that's all they do. This girl actually trains horses and and really does get her fingers dirty. Yeah, Yeah. and helps people. You know, she doesn't just. It's part of what she does is she trains horses by helping people too and and then to round out with the tack and habit segment today i have a a recording that we did over at ada a couple weeks ago the american equestrian trade association of a fascinating group of employees who had to save their company and i want you to hear all about that too so that's coming up as well here on the stable scoop radio show do you realize we're at 183 200 episodes isn't far away oh Yes. Ooh, are we going to do something special? You're going to throw me a party? Party. Let's go to Florida where it's warm. <laughs> okay. Because winter has arrived. That's uh, fine. Just bring me some bear spray. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get to our first guest, uh, Rebecca Hart. Becca, as she is known to her friends, she is a groom for for Missy Ranshausen, who is an inventor. She is a dressage rider. She's a Paralympian. She actually was in the Paralympic Games in Beijing. 
She has represented the United States at several international events, including uh, Para Equestrian World Championships. She's also four-time national championship, winning in 2006, 2008, 2009, and 2010. She's quite good. She was born with a disease called familia. Famili- How do you say that word? Familial. Thank you. Can you say the whole thing? Um... Familial <laughs> spastic paraplegia? Paraplegia? Yeah. Paraplegia, familial spastic paraplegia, which is a genetic does, disease. Yeah, and it causes muscle wasting from uh, from the waist down. So you start to lose uh, control of your muscles from the waist down. Now, she still walks and everything, and she also, she also kayaks, and she sails, and she camps, and she also works as a barista at Starbucks. Mm. Let's find out the rest of the story. Well, hi, Becca, and welcome to the Stable Scoop Show. Thank you. We haven't talked in a little while. I miss you. I know. It's been a while. It's been actually <laughs> since Kentucky when we did the, the whole para support fundraiser. That's right. Yeah, we maybe talked during the World Equestrian Games, but you were kind of busy then. We did briefly, yes. Yeah. yeah, you that were kind of busy. Blur. Yeah, yeah do, she has a life, right. Glenn. Yeah, doing you know. that riding thing. She does. <laughs> the riding thing, and, you know. You know, it's a minor detail, that whole riding internationally. She know. had to put the bonbons down for a couple hours to, you know, like work. <laughs> Speaking of riding, how, how are things going in the para world? You're, you're getting ready and, and hopefully going to be a para Olympian again this year? Hopefully, yes. Uh, we've got a new horse, Lord Ludger, who's, uh, who I'm actually very excited about. We were just down in Florida competing at two uh, champion EDI three stars down there. And he really kind of came to the came to the party and really worked well for me down there. And we had a good win on the second week, which was fabulous. Tell us about the horse. Um, Lord Ludger is actually owned by Missy and Jessica Ranshausen. They very generously... Um, donated him to me when I had to retire my old horse, Martiesa. And I've had him for about a year now. He's a Holsteiner, and he's just, he's a really cool guy. He's always been a dressage horse. He was ridden by able-bodied riders up until a year ago, kind of when I got him. So there was a little bit of a learning curve, kind of figuring out the paracues. Yeah. But he's really, you know, he's really flourishing. Now, have, do, you, do you actually use any, anything extra on your saddle? Any devices? I not my saddle itself is not modified. I have other um, compensating aids that I use. I've got a basically just a, a bucking strap on the front of the saddle in case I lose my balance. I have that too, by I, the way, but for other reasons. <laughs> he has I that on his car. I have that in my car, yeah. A little safety bike. belt, you know. <laughs> 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 Always good things. Um, and then I also have I use um, breakaway Velcro straps to kind of tether my stirrups so that they don't, so my legs don't flop around and upset them at all. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good I idea. Use, it, it really, it works well, especially when some of the more sensitive upper level dressage horses that have all those buttons, you don't want your leg moving around kind of without you wanting it to. <laughs> sure, um, sure. Yeah, so and it just and, helps kind and of with you, your keep legs everything are, there. You're, with you, your legs are really the issue. It's not your arms at this point. Correct. Yeah. yeah, my upper body is relatively normal. Um, there is a little spasticity, but my lower half is essentially paralyzed when I sit on a horse. Yeah, but I'll tell you what. When we go out to dinner, when we've been out to dinner with Becca, the, you are not going. She is not going to be lagging behind getting to the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know when there's food involved, I'm very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you, uh, you I, as I said in the introduction, you're a busy girl. You you're you're a groom for for a professional eventer. You you ride competitively internationally for the parrot team. You've been doing this for a long time, but you also had to make extra money. And by doing that, you work at Starbucks, right? True. Very true. As a barista. I am a barista. So she can make you a cup of coffee to beat none other there, Alina. Oh, totally. there we have a My room for you. Far none. <laughs> we have a room for you, Rebecca. Just come anytime you want. Beautiful. I will be there. How long have you worked for Starbucks? Um, I've been with the company now for five years, actually. All right, and you, how did you fit that into your schedule? What would, what be, uh, you know, let's say during the lead up to the World Equestrian Games, what was your schedule like? Would you work one day a week? Would you work every night? Would you groom during the day, work at night? How did that get work? Basically, they have, um, it's a very early morning, but it's uh, the opening shift. You start at about 4.30, 
and you're done by about 10. So it was actually perfect because I could go and work for about six hours and then go to the farm, work there, ride there, and kind of prepare for the competitions that I needed to. So think about that, so Melina. Like, most, no, it's very flexible. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, most riders, you know, get up and they, they, they go out and they feed and they do that. And then they, they just do one thing. They work their horses during the day and then they're done by evening. You were getting up at probably, what, 3.30 to go to work? Yep, I get up at 3.30, yeah. feed my horses at my house, and then go to the Starbucks, which thankfully has very fabulous coffee and great caffeine. <laughs> well, what a great place to work when you have, I mean, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, exactly. you have to get up, you know, you at, have to get up at early. Yeah. And then what time would you go, to, to go? What time would you get done in the barn every night? Um, you know, when we're going to those international competitions, we'll get done at about 7 or 8, and then we're, you know, doing late night at about nine depending on where we are and kind of the schedule of everyone else's rides and the horses so you know we're, we're done by about nine and then bedtime at 905 <laughs> 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 no uh we, we like to kind of it, it kind of mellows my evenings out a little bit but that's all right yeah, because I, that doesn't give you much sleep time that's the point i was trying to get across is you know you're going to bed at 10 o'clock and getting up at 3 30 uh yeah 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 so now tell me what happened one day at work at Starbucks. I, it, was, it was truly amazing. I mean, Starbucks is a phenomenal company that really takes care of their people, even if you're only a part-timer. And I was, you know, I had been talking to them, and I, they knew about the riding and that kind of thing. And um, they have this elite athlete program. And I was sitting, I was on my lunch break, and I got this phone call from corporate, and they're like, hi. And I was like, Hi, corporate Starbucks. How are you? And um, they said, we love what you're doing. We think it's awesome. We want to support you. And they have helped me ever since. They've been doing that for two years now. And they are a they are one of the main reasons that I can still compete on the, the high level that I do. So what is, I am. What are they doing phenomenal. to help you? Can you say? Um, I can give you a bit. Okay. Um, basically, they do a, a financial contribution, um, and they are sponsoring me um, through the London, excuse me, the 2012 Games. And you know, they're and they're also very flexible with when we just went to Australia. Uh, we just had a pair of team go to Australia, and I needed two weeks off. And the, you know, they're very flexible about holding my job for me while I'm gone for two weeks. You know, at a competition. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Because uh, it allows you they, they the peace of mind amazing. to focus. I mean, because it's, you know, competing at that level is hard enough. But to worry about your job, I just, I, I, yeah, I'm going to look at them in a whole new way. You have to have a job. Yeah. yeah. And who doesn't need to have, I mean, <clears throat> there are very few of us, <laughs> you know, even the 1%, there's like, you know, half a percent of them really need to work. So I don't yep. know. That's, I'm just, I'm really pleased to hear that, that you are allowed to have the freedom of mind, you know, to focus on what you yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. So now, what 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 will change now in the lead ups to the Olympics? How will you qualify for for the team? Um, right now, we just the two we had to do a three star uh, between December and um, March, and so I just did the two down in Wellington. So we're good there, and now we've got the selection trials coming up in um, mid May. And then from there, they'll take the top four from the selection trials, and then we'll just do training camps leading up to the game. Well, that's perfect then. And you're confident? I, you know, you never say those things out loud, but I'm really hoping and for it. I think my horse is talented enough to do it, and he's really, you know, every day he just keeps getting better. Cool. Cool. Well, we're pulling for you. We're going to be excited this to, to hopefully watch you over there in London. Yeah, Thank you got you. a bunch of new fans. Boy, oh boy, are we rooting for you. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be stuff. thinking of you next. Every time I go into Starbucks, I'm going to be thinking of you, and I'm just going to have know, a smile like, on my face. <laughs> you know what they should do? Yeah, they, should, they... they should post updates on your your successes. Yeah, yeah, we should. We should do that. Now, yeah, I mean, they're, they're truly a phenomenal company. When you go to I'm London, do happy. you get free coffee at Starbucks, too? <laughs> no, no, I don't get free coffee. <laughs> don't <laughs> I was going to hook up with her. I know. I was right. I'd have a lot of friends if I got three up. <laughs> now, I, you know, uh, and you're also still, are you still grooming for Missy at this point? 
I am. Um, because I had to, I didn't get to go down for the full winter season, um, we're doing that, you know, I slightly moderated them from what I was doing earlier. But when she comes back to Pennsylvania, yes. And how is she doing this year? I know she has a lot of new horses that she's taken out on the track. She does. She's got some really fun young horses coming along. And um, she was actually just out this weekend and had some good success. Well, terrific. I know I was in Ocala and I went there, but there's like 5,000 horse trailers. And I, and, and I didn't have her phone number, unfortunately, in my phone, so I couldn't call her. And I just didn't get to meet up with her there. I was kind of bummed because I did want she was one, one of the people I wanted to say hi to and see how she was doing. Uh, she's doing from when I last time I've talked to her, she's been going really well. It was ironic that the minute we got there, we walk out to the cross country course, and who's the first rider around but our spotlight rider eventer for the 2010 radio show? Jessica Phoenix was the was just on the track when we got there to watch cross country. So I did get nice. to, did get to see Jesse go. Uh, so for representing Canada up there. Very good. Well, very good. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to hear that story. Good luck this year. We'll be following you, and hopefully we can have you back before you fly off to London. Thank you. That would be great. All right. Thanks, Becca. Bye-bye, Becca. All right. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Bye. Wow. (laughs) Just wow. You don't hear that happening too often, do you? No, and I love it when, um, when what goes around comes around in a really good way. Right. You know, she's yep. she's a hard worker. She buckles down. And, and I mean, she's a very uh, important part of Missy's team. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It just it makes me feel good. I think I'm good for like the rest of the month. <laughs> just listening to her story. Okay, you can't leave now because we got Anna to talk to yet. All right, fine. So so let's uh, talk to Anna right after this week's Equestrian Collections product of the week. Hi, everybody. Glenn here, and I am with Debbie from Equestrian Collections with the Equestrian Collections Product of the Week. And, Debbie, today we're talking about a tie ring. Yes, I want to talk about the Toklat Blocker Tie Ring this week. This is a little gizmo. It's like in the form of a figure eight. The small ring at the top attaches to a snap that you can move around. You can move this anywhere. It can be a cross part of your cross tie. It can be on your trailer. It can be really anywhere. The bottom ring is larger, and it has a tongue that comes up the middle. What you do is you take your lead rope, and when you pull the tongue down, you lay the lead rope on top of the tongue and push it back up. There's a little magnet there that will attach it to the ring. So the, essentially what you have is a figure eight with a tongue up the middle and the lead rope that goes around the tongue. What this does is it allows the horse to pull back. He does not get loose. His halter does not break. But when he pulls back and really realizes that he is not Um, tied up tight, they relax. It's perfect for teaching babies to stand uh, tied to a a trailer. Um, It's great if you're on a trail ride and you're a little bit nervous. You put this on and if something spooks them, doesn't matter. They might pull back, but they will not get loose and they'll relax once they know that they're not tied. That's the Toklat Blocker Tie Ring. And as these segments are going to cost me money, Debbie, because now I have to buy a couple of these. <laughs> and you can buy them at equestriancollections.com. Just search for Blocker Tie Ring and you'll bring them up. They're made of stainless steel, too, so good, sturdy stuff. And next up, Anna Twinney, the founder of Reach Out to Horses, based in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains of Golden, Colorado, is going to talk to us about her new DVD and a couple other things that Glenn and I are going to throw her way because we know Anna can handle it. Welcome, Anna. Yay, Anna's back. How are you, Anna? I'm great, Lena. Thank you so, so much for having me back. And what I really am looking forward to is as I look out of my window, we've still got two to three feet of snow here. And I truly do have icicles that are five feet long. Oh, gosh. And it's that thing of on the mountain, eight and a half thousand feet high. It's a little bit chillier and Colorado up and down temps. But on the 19th, on Sunday, I fly out to Arizona to gentle the last, I say the last six falls because eight went to Connecticut, six went to Arizona, and one of them, we had 15 all in. She stayed in North Dakota, the people that had, the, I, I would say, the B&B for the horses. 
um, fell in love with her and they ended up keeping her. So I fly out to Arizona to gentle the, the final six, which have grown up a little bit more since I would have seen the ones in Connecticut in November. So it's going to be wonderful. We've got a great group of people, students coming in actually from New York, Africa, and Colorado for this class. Wow. Remind everybody now- what the falls are. Yeah, these are former PMU foals, and I say former because what happened, Glenn, is when the Premarin industry sort of um, reduced their numbers and they went from approximately 50,000 mares to about 6,000 mares, be it that they changed Premarin or be it that it became Prem Light and the mares ended up with different destinies, there were 6,000 left, and right now that's the numbers that I'm being told. And so what would happen is a number of the ranchers in Canada would lose the contracts. And so some are actually breeding um, for a delicacy, which is very hard to just even say the words. They're shipping the foals live to Japan and, I believe, Europe, where they're a delicacy on a menu. And there's a ranch in Canada that has 2,000 mares, and they're doing that. So the farmers found different ways after they lost the contract, be it that they were even breeding for people to rescue them. And in this case, it's a former PMU farmer that had about X amount of mares left, but 15 foals got bred this year. And his whole idea was he was going to pull out of the industry. I teamed up with Frank Weller as Equine Angels. He liaised with the farmer, and we saved the foals pre-going to the feedlot. And it's my understanding also that Frank was pretty much involved in getting the mares off the property, which would have shut down that establishment. So slightly different scenario than, than the PMU, but certainly former PMU. PMU standing for Premarin. And that means pregnant mare's urine. And it's a hormone replacement therapy for women. And it it means that the mares actually need to be pregnant in order to collect the urine for that hormone replacement therapy. And the foals are a byproduct. And so their destiny truly is the feedlot. And yet, when you get to meet them, and I put a big and yet in there, they're just mind-blowing and amazing. And I, I got to document the the full gentling class I did in November, December, I did a diary on it, put it on YouTube under Reach Out to Horses, and it's amazing. You see them from feral foals, literally, where we herded them in a trailer, herded them into the arena, and you see them go through the six-day Reach Out to Horses program, which means like the first introduction, first acknowledgement, first touch, first halter, first hand grooming and grooming and then steps to leading, leading and then loading and obstacle course and farrier positions and blanketing. And you see this, all their progress is amazing over six days where they graduate. And, and I don't know anybody that wouldn't fall in love with them. You know, in an odd way, I'd say even the colors, we had Palomino, Buckskin, Chestnut, Roan. People like colors. I say fortunately or unfortunately they do. But um, you'll have the smaller boned individuals and the drafts. In the Premarin industry, usually there would be a lot of draft horses because they're larger, so more collection of the urine. But in, in this batch that we had, I would say maybe three were draft based. There's a paint um, kind of a buckskin paint as well and a bay they were sort of larger boned and the others truly weren't and so it could be that there's a quarter horse influence there too but all of the foals I've touched they're just beautiful you know such different temperaments and personalities and structures and they can go into any industry depending on the confirmation you know you could go into right. dressage or jumping or trails or or healers, whatever you'd want, there's really a place for every single foal. And we're still looking for homes. I will plug that. Oh, you know, we, plug we away. Them. Yeah, and we, we really do want the homes. So there's still six foals in Connecticut looking for their forever homes. And then there's the six foals in Arizona, if you happen to be more on the west. Um, they're looking for the homes too. And, and they're precious. You know, how, I, I mean, oh, yeah, they're precious. How many, roughly how many... Uh, foals do you get to work with at Premarin Foals do you work with each year ballpark 
It, it does vary, Lena, and it really was this year. So last year was the batch, and then this batch this year. And I'm truly hoping to find another rescue. I go actually go out to Ohio in May, and um, I'm doing Reiki for horses at a beautiful rescue out there, getting to know the people. And they rescue more than a hundred a year, and I'd love to get a okay. rapport going with them to really try and help this. So for me. There's so many challenges. It takes a village to rescue the foals. But I like that you're setting up you're setting up sort of this chain of um, events in the foals' lives. So you know, Absolutely. it seems like the first thing is that you you get them uh, off the trucks, or you don't even let them get on the yeah. trucks, and then they get. So do they? Do you go to them, or do you? Are they shipped to locations where you're you're already working, sort of like these partner farms? How they, does they that were work? Shipped. Yeah, they were shipped. It is at this village because Frank was the contract for the Canadian um, people. So he's the the individual bringing them in. He is the rescue. Reach Out to Horses got truly involved more this year than I've ever, ever gotten involved. And the intention was to fundraise partial funds. And we ended up fundraising 22000 for these foals. Um, the money came in all over from the donations, from guest speaking from a restaurant a strings here in Denver we we did tons and we raised the funds so that means you have to buy the foals in fact a lot of the farmers will raise the the money so the meat market is usually 75 for the foal and yet they were asking over 300 to, to of course the foal yeah. you know and the, the other piece to that is it means if you pay it, you could wait for them to go to the feedlot, but then they're going to be loaded up, go to the feedlot, be in an awful place for however long and potentially going through an auction where you could save them that, from that trauma by just being intersecting it. And so the farmer ended up doing the coggins and shipping to the border. Then you got the border fees. Then you bring them over the border, and Frank arranged all of this. They ended up going to North Dakota to sleep there and stay there. And then... I believe the Connecticut batch had about a week there and that formed part of the quarantine and then they were shipped to Connecticut. And it also gave them the rest because these little little beings, be it that they're three months old or five months old, depending on where they were born and when they were born, um, they need that break. Yeah. And so th- they were there and then they came to us in Connecticut where they had another two weeks to settle in and the quarantine before I arrived. Uh, with my students, and that's when the gentling process started. So they would have been weaned probably a, about four weeks, a month before I would have handled them. Okay. And then once they arrive, so this is quite the journey, um, and, and they've they've lived a long life in their couple of short months. So by the time they arrive yeah. at the place where um, you get to start working with them, how, I would imagine that even these these uh, short experiences are starting to show their personalities. So their their early experiences, they're starting to. Can you tell when you first meet these foals? Um, is there anything inherent in them? You know that nature versus nurture that you could say, oh, this one's this one's kind of feisty and energetic, and know that that personality is going to stay with that animal for its life. Are, are, you know what can you see at this stage? In there. You know, it's like you were there, actually, and I, I know I wish you <laughs> would be there, but it was exactly like that. What happens is they're in a little paddock, and I do watch them first to see who's eating, who's got the head up, who would maybe nicker towards us, who's huddled behind another. So you, you can get a little bit of a read there. And then what happens is during the herding of getting them onto the trailer, you'll get the true personality shine in. So the key will be to get the lead foal to want to go into that trailer because if they don't they can block all the other foals and they can take them away and in one instance the students used a tad too much pressure and too much pressure can mean arms up or intention you know Mm -hmm. and the foals went to jump the fence and so you've really got to have that fine line of ask but be firm suggest keep their nose towards the trailer and wait you know a lot of pausing a lot of pausing but if you pause too much they see it as a weak thing and they come through you if you ask too hard they come through you so it is that fine line it's during this loading and during the piece of observation that you'll see now when they come out of the trailer same thing at this point i'll have a mindset to go okay hmm he went in first he didn't even batter an eyelid didn't look back 
eating in the trailer. He looks very comfortable. And usually that, that one would be the first one to come out, that you go, okay, here's my steady one. He's also protecting the food. Then you'll have the flighty ones, and you'll have some like sticking like glue to another foal. And you know that will be a harder one to gentle than the mm. others. At that time, at least for that week. So what will happen is, out of the eight foals that were there, we had one exceedingly gentle. She came that way. I named her Charm. She, she's the only one I named. Everybody else had the opportunity to name foals. And, and a school here in Colorado, um, a 12-year-old boy fundraised 300 at his school to save a life. And we called his foal Tegan's Typhoon. They named that foal. So each foal has a very specific name and a very good reason, like Touched by a Horse, Melissa Pierce. They fundraised and we called their for wisdom. And I could go on and on. We had another one, Aria. So the, the names are very meaningful for us. And so what would happen is once the foals are then in the little stalls that we'd created in the indoor arena, we would give them a chance to eat and drink and sleep and rest, and they would always have access to food and water. I never deprive them from that, and I don't believe in that. I don't think we have to lead them to food and water. I think the main thing is their comfort. And you would also get another personality read there of who would be standing at the far end of the, the stall, not come to you, who would look at you even, because a lot of the PMU foals or formers, they won't look because their first interaction with mankind has been horrible. They've been forcefully weaned, they've had a coggins, they've been in a chute, they've been in an awful trailer, they're not knowing where they're heading, so they don't have a good impression of us. But they will vary. So Charm didn't bring baggage with her. She's been cute as punch and gorgeous. Aria <laughs> has truly just protected herself. The whole week you'd see her protecting, saying, I'm not going to look at you, I'm not going to look at you. So we had to work on that. Um, Tegan's Typhoon, standoffish. He'd let you close by two inches, but the last two inches he'd bolt through you. Wisdom, the paint, beautiful. She'd totally look at you with both eyes, and she'd be quite animated with her moves. Mm. And then we, we gentled her through grooming. You know, try and get uh, anything on her was a big no. She'd, she'd run around in circles. And we ended up gentling her by getting the burrs out and grooming her. And she came around absolutely wonderfully by day five, I think, four or five. So some would come around day two, three, mm -hmm. and some it would even be the last day. And the personalities, yeah, the, you didn't have one same personality there. That that's the gorgeous thing. So when somebody thinks, oh, there's a method to gentle a foal, the foal has to fit into this method, absolute baloney. You know, you've got to meet the foal where they're at. What baggage are they carrying? How sensitive are they? What is their learning style? What is their personality? And truly, you meet them exactly where they are, Lena. Now, so what, what, um, what can you get done? You're there for five or six days with them. Yeah. What, yeah. At what point are they when, when they leave you? Now, all of what I mentioned will, will get done for the majority. So I, if I had 10 foals there all in, and it's a whole other topic because I had nurse foals there too, but out of the 10 foals, everybody um, would have had the first touch, had the hand grooming, had the haltering, had the first step, so that would be neck yields, head drops, disengaging, and leading. Everybody had that. Um, I would say three quarters would have had saddle pads on them, and that's just desensitizing. Doesn't nothing to do with saddling. And they nearly all had blankets on as well. If not all, actually, if we look at the DVDs, all of them. Um, they had the obstacle course in hand, which actually gets them ready for the leading, you know, the stops and the leading correctly and the respect. And half of them were loading into trailers at that time. So my aim and my hope always is if I can get them gentled where somebody can go up to them and halter them, uh, potentially groom them, pick up feet, do farrier positions, and at least three quarters had farrier positions. And what that means is when the farrier comes, if we've done a good job, and I've got proof with it with two of them, Marnin and um, Sham, they've gone to their foster home. They had the farrier, and they were brilliant. They stood there absolutely marvelously like statues ultimately. And that was purely two days of picking up feet in farrier positions, maybe four days of picking up feet. 
So if you start them properly, that will go with them for life. But you make a mistake, and that could potentially also grow into something large. So, for example, Shem at one point showed his backside and pinned ears to protect his food. He did it once on my class, and we moved him off his food. He never did it again. He did it once at the foster home, same thing. Tried it with people going, this is my food, get out of the area. And I spoke to Nanette, she's a close friend of mine. She did the same thing. We, we basically said that's unacceptable. He's never done it again. But you imagine him in the wrong home where he just pins an ear. He's a large horse. He's going to be big as a draft horse baby, um, he's going to learn the undesirable behavior. And that's when they get bad names. So people wanting to gentle foals, they have to be experienced. It's not one of those things that you look at the foal and go, okay, I will save this foal. I have no experience, but we'll learn together. That's a tough one because you need to bring the intricacies of the language of Equus with you. You need to know the methodologies because one minor mistake will shape a behavior pattern and ultimately like lena was saying can you tell the personality absolutely Mm. so charm will be forgiving and cute and enjoy life and enjoy new experiences where there's a couple of them there like aria when we did the obstacle course with her it had to be on a long 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 line she wanted to make every decision and if you told her she'd stop and not move So she's going to need a specialist working with her because somebody green won't understand that strong personality type. So there's much that will come through in the six days with the personality read that one can put on the website to say this is who we're dealing with and this will be the best match as to what we see today. You know, it's it's different, Alina. We we had started. We had a we had several babies in in the time we've had horses over the over the years, and we we forget. If you've raised your own, you forget that you have yeah. spent uh, three to six months with them before you're getting them. So, and they've had a lovely life with us, and they've been yeah. touched from the time they were babies, and you've had them halted from the time they were you know, a week old. So they're used to all of that. We forget that that these babies aren't that way. You know, you, no. You, yeah. Do you – but do you – the a question I have that – I'm listening and even Glenn, as you're talking and, you know, this nice life that you have and Anna, how you say that your, their comfort is probably is the priority. Yeah. Do you keep them in groups or, you know, yeah. it's hard to sometimes train a baby, you know, in a group. But to me, that would represent the ultimate in comfort for them. How does and that help would- or hinder? You know, and in an ideal situation, I've gentled um, foals, Mustang foals, in, in a 100-acre pasture. The most challenging thing I've ever done, because the stallion would tell me when the lesson was over. It didn't matter if it was on a good note or not. He literally and looked at like me and walking. <laughs> yeah, and off comes the halter and out you run, you know. But, yeah. but in this situation, with the babies, what I did was create an arena, and I set up 12 by 12 panels. So they all had their stall, and in their stall, they had the water and the food and ultimately their name later on but here's the key because i'm totally on your page it's easier to gentle them one by one because otherwise they would have hidden and it could have taken weeks or months to Uh, truly get them to come around where they said i'm volunteering now so So the key was how you set up the the yeah. arena they so they could all see each other, see each yeah. other but you're actually working yeah. with them on one yeah but there's another piece to it so yeah they all see each other and totally open to them snuggling you know go through the fence learn from that other foal like charm she's the one that would go breathe with you and she'd want the grooming and the foal next door could see that although we're predators we're not acting like a predator and that charm thought we were safe so they could learn from that So that was crucial. But here's the other piece. In the evening, we'd herd them out, and they'd go in a stall, and two would go in a stall together. So they'd have comfort. They'd lie, sleep together, and they'd be together. And then occasionally when we could, we'd herd all back in in the morning, and they could all play. We did that two, three times during the week. So evenings, absolutely. They'd go back into their herd with their family, just a smaller group, and Yeah, in the day they could see each other and they'd have a chance to play in Rome. And, yeah, I don't think we need to deprive them of their own kind 24-7. I think it's hard enough to come into class. We would start herding them at 8.30 in the morning, put them in there, 
and then they'd have at least an hour quiet where I would lecture and we had a, a room where we could look out it was perfect so we could watch them eating and drinking and sleeping and all that fun stuff then we'd come out in the morning and I'd do some demos and then the students would buddy up so there's two students together and that would mean you'd be allocated a foal and you could watch your partner and then the foal wouldn't be overworked and you'd go and watch the other foal so you might have maybe a couple of hours in the morning so that would work out an hour per foal we'd have lunch the foals are left alone completely nobody was really allowed to be there occasionally they could eat their lunch sitting with the foal but occasionally i would also say you need to come out because even sitting with the foals can create some degree of pressure and the same in the afternoon there'd be a demo we'd work the foals again we'd herd them back to the stalls so it was based a lot on the foals if the foals were sleeping i'd ask the students not to wake them up so you'd basically have to sit there you know, here's people going, I want a gentle fall, I want the hands on. Well, your fall's lying down. Now you're just going to have to sit with your chair and just be present or go and help your buddy because they're the priority and their right. needs need to be met at, at all. You know, as much as we can, there's going to be times, like I mentioned to Aria, there's going to be times where she got pushed and I did an hour lesson with her to get her to face up. By, I think it was day four, it was this time of, Aria, you've got to look at me. You've got to look at me and I'm going to prove to you that it's okay and we captured just a picture of this later um, and after my hour she put her head into my arms and you, you see me crying too it's this thing of you question yourself did I push her a lot did I how far did I go here and the proof is always in the fall after how do they respond and she came straight up and hmm. she buried her head in there and how do I read that? It was this thing of she finally took notice, she finally looked, and she finally realized that even if she's pushed, meaning pushed to look at me, she was right. never going to get hurt. She was never going to be in a place of true fear or force. She might have been uncomfortable for a little bit, but she wasn't roped. She wasn't put into anything she couldn't handle. She was always free in that area um, with a little bit of... I say huge encouragement to to face up ultimately, and which you know it's uh, it's interesting that um, a youngster, such a young animal, such a young uh, foal, could uh, experience that being pushed out of her comfort zone and learn yeah. from it. You know, sometimes I I think that only the older horses can handle right. that, you know, or the juniors can right. handle that. But it's really nice to know that even as babies, they can handle that. But like you said, you have to walk that fine line and find just that Absolutely. right spot for them. Now, I, you know, I, I, we're, as Glenn was just letting me know, we're running out of time and I <laughs> kind of gave him a snarky reply, but, um, I, I didn't, I don't want to end this. <laughs> Shut up. Um, I, we could go, let's do a whole nother episode on foals, but, uh, you also have something special coming out soon. Um, that I think just anything that you have to share with the world in regard to horses is important. Um, and that's a new DVD on something that you do called Reiki and it's energy healing for horses. Give us a quick overview of what that is. It's wonderful you bring it in as well because the energy healing comes in with the foals, Lena. And there was one foal, I have to share this, it was Tegan's Typhoon. And I was doing a demo for the student and this was the last four to six inches that I was talking about. And I ended up just um, using the back of my hand, waving my hand in a circular motion around the horse, first at the withers and then, if you like, sort of painting the horse without touching. And then my hand stroke changed and my student went, you're doing Reiki. And I went, yes. And I thought, wow, I've just been caught off guard a little bit. But it felt like the right thing to do. It felt like it was a pretty much an aura cleanse. So you've got the energy field around you. Everybody has it. And I ended up doing an aura cleanse for this young foal. And it was awesome because he went from twitching and not being sure to standing beautifully still, which he had not done, did a complete aura cleanse. And then by the time on this one side, it was the off side. And then by the time I went to touch, it was all right. And so the Reiki came in there and we can put the Reiki into the water. We can put it into the stool. We can put it directly onto the horse. We can put symbols on the horses. And it's a form of energy healing. It stands for universal life force. It's a Japanese art. 
and you get attuned to become a Reiki practitioner, one, two, or Reiki master, or Karuna Reiki master. And the different levels changes your vibrational frequency. It heightens your awareness. It helps with animal communication for sure, meaning interspecies communication, telepathy, interaction. I learned partially the Reiki 2 and Reiki Master for untouched horses and wild horses to allow them to feel that energetic connection to help gentle them. So with the babies, we utilize a number, number of us utilized the Reiki where we saw it would fit right and where it felt right. It wasn't a must, but a lot of the students there happened to be Reiki practitioners that I've attuned. So with the Reiki um, Energy Healing for Horses DVD, it's a two-part DVD set. It's the first one of its kind being launched. What makes it unique is not just the Reiki for horses. I totally teach about giving the, the animal a voice, giving a voice to the horse. So what it means is recognizing the registers, Reiki registers. So those are releases, relaxation signs, understanding what the horse is telling you, where to place the hands, how firm to place the hands, how long to place them there, how to create that true treatment from chakra balancing through to love lessons, which is something I've coined, um, through to the full Reiki treatment, Reiki grooming, auric cleansing. It's all on there. And now, it's do you, based on 50 do you need to know? Do you need to know Reiki before you attempt it? <laughs> you, you ask great questions, Lena. It's awesome. You know, and you have to think about that when you put it out there because that is the big question of, one, it's a sacred art. So there's nothing on there that shouldn't be. So the symbols are sacred. They're, they're secret and sacred. They're not on the DVD. But when I put it out, I also realize that there's so many energy healers out there that are either utilizing their own energy or utilizing a form of bit reconnective healing, healing touch for animals, vortex healing, any kind of healing, quantum. And this DVD will speak to any energy healer. But my intention truly also was to introduce people to Reiki, to say, look at the DVD. If this speaks to you and you've been utilizing your own energy system, try Reiki because Reiki is a universal life force. So it's going to introduce people to Reiki. It's going to help all energy healers and truly across the board. It will be wonderful. Mm -hmm. The intention was to help the horses. And so, yes, you'd need to be attuned to Reiki, but this is the first step to see, does this resonate with me? Is this something I feel drawn to? Is this something I feel like I've been doing something similar? Because people might look at it and go, well, I've been doing Reiki forever. That's what I've been doing. No, you've been doing energy healing um, because Reiki is an attunement from a master. And if you see them as different strands all going to source, you can call it spirit, God, source, universe, and each one will have a strand like its own fingerprint going up. So yes, undoubtedly, there's different forms of energy, but the ones for Reiki will be unique. And where can people find all of this stuff that you do? <laughs> yeah, we have the website, so reachouttohorses.com, and we've got the Reiki for Horses DVD on the front page there. And under the events calendar, we'll have Reiki classes here in Colorado, in Wyoming as well, in Ohio too. We're coming to Ohio in May, so Reiki's on there. And the falls this year, right now, Arizona in um, at the end of this month, February. And yeah, Lena, I'm really looking at um, rescue, being part of another rescue and continuing this. It's my dream to continue the full gentling to rescue. So all the events are on there. The eight DVDs are on there. We've got the Falls in Training DVD set. It's a, amazing. It's five and a half hours worth where people can literally witness what I've said here and create methodologies. So that's on there too, um, and I'd love for them to visit. We've got a Facebook page. Um, we've got the blog. There's so many avenues. We've got the YouTube. 160 videos are on YouTube, which are free for, for people to go and watch, including the diary. And I will make a new diary in Arizona, a day-to-day -day diary that you guys can follow too because the falls are obviously in a different location, so in the desert, and also they'll be a little older. So I think that will speak to a lot of people to see that. Okay. Fabulous. Great. Well, thank ah. you so much again, Anna. We really appreciate you joining us today, and good luck with the babies. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you so much, Lena. Thank you for your style of interview. It's been awesome. It's always fun to be with you guys. You know, Helena, we have a lot of guests on here with English accents, a lot, and I still don't get sick of them.
All you need is an English accent and a bikini <laughs> and maybe a pulled pork sandwich. <laughs> oh, if that girl from, if, uh, what was her name? Uh, uh, let me see here. The swimsuit girl, Kate Upton, had an English accent. Woohoo! <laughs> and a burger nearby <laughs> and her own grill. All right, it's time for our Tack and Habit segment. We have a very special segment planned for you today. It's a recording that we did at the American Equestrian Trade Association. And I think you're going to enjoy this heartwarming story. And we're going to get to that right after this word from Kentucky Performance Products. Choosing a supplement can be confusing. How do you know which ones are right for your horse? Kentucky Performance Products will simplify your search for effective research-proven supplements that meet the challenges of today's horses. And this week's highlight product is Contribute Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement. The properties of omega-3 fatty acids benefit every system in your horse's body. Contribute improves breeding efficiency in mares and stallions. Maintains soundness and protects joints from damaging inflammation. Sustains a strong immune response in horses of all ages and decreases the levels of inflammation in your horse's body by sustaining adequate omega-3 fatty acid levels. Learn more about Contribute omega-3 fatty acid supplement and all the other products at kppusa.com that's kentucky performance products at kppusa.com Well, we have our next guest coming up. I, I is a story that we talked about uh, a little earlier in the show, and it, it's a story that uh, is quite amazing. And it's our amazing story of the weekend that we found from a company, and we're going to let them tell the story of what happened because it's a company called California Equine Products. And when when Emily and Bertha started telling us this story, we were just amazed at 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 what you guys did and overcame to keep this company going. So good morning, by the way. Good morning. Tell, who's going to tell the story of what happened? Bertha, go ahead. Bertha's getting pointed at. Yeah. <laughs> She's fighting her. Who's going to tell the story? Good so morning, everyone. T- tell us how this all panned out and how you ended up here with Emily as California Equine Products. Uh, we, were, we were a manufacturer of quality leather products in, based in California. And you worked there. And we worked there for over 20 years. The employees have been there some 32 years, 36 years. Um, and the company went out of business last January. Through our shock, and we were didn't know what to do. Now, this, when you say went out of business, they knocked on the door one day and said, you guys have to leave. You're done. Yeah. I mean, they, this was not something you had a warning about? No, we had no idea. And so go to they, work one day and say, sorry, you're out of work tomorrow. Yes. That's they, a little shocking. They did it through a phone call. They called us up and they said, you know what, send everyone home. We're not do, we're, we can't do it anymore. Uh, we're out of business. Close the doors. Just walk away. Ouch. And, and we just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And um, so after we were shocked for like three days, we thought, we got to do something about this. We have a good company. We have a reputable product, um, and we thought we just have to keep going. We have customer base. We have a lot of loyal customers. Yeah, you have a lot of loyal customers who've been with you for years and years, along with yes. the employees. Sure. And so we said, you know, let's st- stick together. We figured as a group uh, we can do something about this. So the employees got together, and we said, let's all stick together. Let's find an investor to help us uh, get out of the situation. So we did find an angel investor um, to help us out. You just got on the phone, didn't you? You yeah. just started calling people, calling people all in the industry uh, to help us out. And every, they were calling their friends, and whoever can help us did. Mm-hmm. Um, so then within the third week of this, you know, upside down thing we did, um, we got found an investor. He came in. He says, yes, he likes it. Um, he liked the idea, and he he knew that we knew what we were doing. So he helped us with the money. We moved. Um, so you had to move to a new physical location. Yes, we moved to a new location. Uh, we thought of a new name, so we started under a new company name. So how many employees were involved in this whole process 
of re of the rebirth of this company. Six employees. Six employees got together, mm-hmm. got on the phone, mm-hmm. started calling people, and you used those customers that were happy with the product lines that you've been producing for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And it was just a case of everybody started helping out. Every contact was worthwhile. Yes. So we started, um, the grand opening was April, and we've been doing really, really well. Thanks to our customers who are loyal to the product. Um, and we've been doing shows and trying to get our name uh, reestablished out there. And So you all went from being employees to bosses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people total now work for California Equine Products? Uh, there's 20 uh, full-time employees. That's pretty significant in the tax business, really. And you, yeah. you're... You're in California. You manufacture in California. Everything is made in California. Um, we buy only uh, number one premium hides. Uh, like I said, we're known for our quality. Um, we have good craftsmanship. We do all hand tooling. We hand stitch. Uh, we And we're known for um, our special order request. We can pretty much make anything. We get a lot of customers who say, you know, my horse's head is this size. Can you make me a bridle? Um, and we can. We can pretty much do anything in leather. Tell us what you do make. What kind of products do you do? Uh, we manufacture uh, all types of Western saddles, uh, show, rainers, trail riders, barrel, not barrel racers, uh, ropers. Um, we do a real, we, uh, we manufacture tack for the race industry. We do really, really well on the racetrack. Uh, so, and, and I'll clarify that because I see you have one of those here is when you see the horses, the, the great horses we talk about all the time here on the show, going around the track in the white bridles, you guys help them do that, don't you? Yes. And we have one right here, right? One of the white ones. And they're not just white bridles. These are white leather bridles. bridles. And I think you guys are probably the only ones. There's maybe one other company anywhere that makes the white leather, leather bridles, bridles for the racehorses. It's and beautiful. Yeah, it is. And it doesn't smell like a dead camel. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's yes, lovely. right. But, no, these are beautiful, the white uh, bridles, and uh, very popular in racing. Yes, yes, and everybody likes the quality of the leather. Like I said, we only use the number one hides, and it's a good premium uh, white leather. Soft. Yeah, soft. <laughs> soft. And you have some gorgeous Western head stalls over there. In the When I was walking around the booth, just beautiful work. It, it really is. It's not... It's not as blingy as some of the companies are. Some of the companies, you walk in and you just about want to wear sunglasses. Um, yours is, I think, what I would call, I don't know if traditional is the right word, but it's more of the tooling and the quality of the edge work and and that kind of thing that really seemed to make it stand out for me is that it makes me think of going into a high-quality furniture store. It's not all shiny and glitzy. It's just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> And then you had something else that kind of caught Glenn's eye sitting over here, and it's bright purple. Tell us about what's going on here. This is awesome. We do a very, very nice uh, bareback pad. It has a wool felt bottom, and it's got a suede top, and it's got a latigo hand grip, and it's got latigo tie straps on the side where you can attach your cinches to. And we sell lots and lots of these bareback so pads. Pretty. I mean, and everybody just loves them. This one happens to be purple. You make them in other colors. But yes. I, I can see Helena really liking this particular. So the, the, is this called burgundy leather that the Latigo straps yeah. are made of? So it's the burgundy leather, and it's got brass D-rings. It's right. not the nasty old no coated stuff that's going to rust after three years. And then the handhold is beautifully hand-stitched burgundy leather. It's not the camel stuff. And then what really caught our eye is right in the center, about where the pommel would be if it were an English saddle. Um, there's a beautiful there's plate, else. name plate, uh, for equine. Now, is that silver or is it uh, it's stainless? Plated. It's plated. plated. It's plated silver. It's plated silver. Mm-hmm. And that's just beautiful. It just kind of kicks it up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's really spiffy. And the, the We're having one of these sent out to Jamie, who just got a new off-the-track thoroughbred that she rescued. And I'm sure she would just love to ride in a bareback pad rather than her saddle. So, she <laughs> so we're just going to send one of these out to her. It has a nice hand, handle there, too. It does have a beautiful handle on it. It'd be yeah. great. This is gorgeous. It is beautiful. So, so many of the bareback pads just don't you know, look nice, and they're just crappy looking, you know. And this one's just pretty. This is, you wouldn't be afraid to use this one anywhere. No, yeah. and it's sticky because it's suede on top. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. 
Very cool. Well, this is great. I'm so proud of you guys for what you did. You Instead of just rolling over, you said, you know, I'm going to take charge of this, and we're going to make this work, and you did. And so now it's an employee-owned company. Yes. There aren't a lot of those in the, in the horse industry. And then we didn't say a word. I didn't. <laughs> she has a birth account. I really Emily's just here to look cute. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the website? Where can people find yourself? At www.caequine.com. Caequine.com. Yes. All right. That's terrific. Thank you, and good luck with the company. We're so proud of you guys. Thank you so much. All right. We had a couple very heartwarming stories today. We did. I, like I said, I'm inspired. I'm good for the rest of the month. Yeah, what's one of the things I like about doing the Stable Scoop show is we don't do the same thing every week. We have, you know, something different every week, and that, that just makes it so much fun. But I think we're both due for another one-on-one, don't you? Oh, goodness, yes. Oh, yes. Do you have any ideas in mind of who you want to get? Yes. Okay, good. All right, got to figure it out. i got to come up with somebody that I want to do in a one-on-one show. Plus, we have not forgotten... And we're going to be working it out for probably the end of March, but uh, it's time for the annual Horse Husbands episode. <gasps> where, right. And then the annual, annual follow-up with the wives coming on and t- saying everything we said was wrong. So that that's coming up here, hopefully very soon at the end of March. We're putting that together. I have some ideas for the Horse Husbands I want to get this year. Okay. So that's coming up. Okay. Well, that's it for this week, uh, Helena. Be sure to visit all of our episodes. You can listen to all of our past episodes at StableScoop.com. It's easy. Just go there, hit the play button. You can download them on iTunes. Just search for Stable Scoop and hit the subscribe button on iTunes. They'll automatically be downloaded to your iPod or your MP3 player or your iPhone. And, you know, we love your feedback, don't we? We do. And me in particular, I need all the help I can get. So if you have something nice to say, send me an email. <laughs> if you have something bad to say, send me an email. <laughs> I mean, constructive criticism is always welcome. But join the fun. You can find us on Facebook. Just look for Stable Scoop. Glenn and I tweet periodically. He's at Horse Radio. I'm at Helena B. Uh, but you know what? All you need to remember is one link. That's StableScoop.com. That's it stablescoop.com something you heard today piques your interest and you can't remember it if you're like me it goes in one ear and out the other just remember stable scoop we have a fantastic search feature up there put in that little keyword you remembered and you're sure to find the podcast on it all right thank you helena that's it for this week everybody that's plenty there'll be more next week 